All right, guys. Well, good morning. Good morning. I see my friends on here, Dr. G, CJ. Thank you guys for joining. Um, you know, everybody else have been on here. Uh, 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 you know, Reverend Delman, of course, we've been rolling together for a long time. Patrick for years as well over in that's my uh, West Coast people and Joe. Um, oh, Taylor's on here. Awesome. What's up, buddy? Good to see you. Hey, sorry it took me a while. My computer is being slow. That's okay, bro. We, we are happy to have you on here. Um, so Susan is on. You just missed her a little bit, but she is, uh, she introduced herself just a moment ago. So she just went black so the men can join. Um, so basically, especially this is for Taylor, you know, Dr. G and CJ, this time is a call where we get together and just think of it as a virtual coffee hangout where we get together the men that are involved, that care about this movement, that care about um, any role, seeing how they can be involved in fighting human trafficking um, on whatever capacity that may be. And so you're looking, these men, of course, as you see, we see different backgrounds from racial makeup to um, you know lifestyles to careers. And so the beautiful thing about this group, everybody is not a professional in HT, right? And that's what we love because we're trying to show that you can have your own career and own different life assignment, but that God has some kind of way called you as a man of faith to come in and do something, right? And so it's just a time to talk, get ideas, learn from what folks are doing. We have some guys in here doing some incredible things. Um, share anything you've been a part of and actually just ask any questions uh, that you may have. This is an open event where we invite guys. So if you know guys at, you know, after this that would want to know more, uh, want to have a network of other men across America, uh, to figure out what they're doing, uh, just to be inspired. This is the call. So what we're going to do today is we're going to just have open dialogue where today we're going to focus, though, our, well, let's have a little theme. Today, the theme will be leadership, which is one of my favorites. I love this because, you know, be, I, I really believe in and We've seen that, especially as, you know, Christian men in the Bible. It's always as your leader go, as the people go. You know, your leader lacks the faith, the people are going to be faithless, right? But if the people are faithless and the leader is faithful, the people have a chance for redemption and a chance to come. So um, we want to really focus on what does that mean to everybody today? And so this is not, we don't, this is not a presentation. This is not a talking to. Um, we just want to get ideas from you guys. So I'll ask some questions and you, you know, we'll, we'll just talk about those questions and uh, share some time. I would really love, you know, to, to hear mm -hmm. like, what are some of those examples of leadership? Like I look at everybody on the screen and I know I'm looking at nothing but leaders on here in so many. I've seen you do it physically. I've seen you do it virtually. Um, and it's, but what does that mean to you? And, and, and as you talk about that, think about the context of making a, po a positive impact in human trafficking as you speak about this leadership. Okay. So what we'll do first, we'll go around. We'll have everyone. We'll start with my guy, Patrick, at the top. Um, then go around and just introduce ourselves. And you'll just introduce yourself with your name. Then you share your entity or entities if you're Patrick, and uh, you will talk and just kind of share what what um what kind of what what do you do with those things? Like what, what like he, you know one of his things is Father Con. He'll kind of share. He won't give you the whole mission and all that, but he'll just kind of give you a con the concept. Like here's what Father Con is about. Mm -hmm. So your name, entity, and kind of like a little bit of how you how you serve. So Patrick. <laughs> okay, Patrick Erlinson. Um, I'm in the Los Angeles area. <laughs> Um, I was with the Long Beach Human Trafficking Task Force for about a decade, yeah. um, and which, which spawned a lot of things. So I started with men standing against trafficking, where we took over a street corner with, with men to really get them kind of to do something and engage with the issue. Um, that led to starting a film and art festival, um, so for human trafficking awareness, which we've held two now, and we're working on the third for next year. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a big event, two day two day event with. Yeah. music dance film really engaging the arts community and raising awareness of human trafficking um, and then the one that's really close to my heart is father con which is really really kind of the con the con is men are getting conned into believing that they're happy you know in the back seat of a car with a 12 year old or they're they're happy kind of indulging themselves and in what they you know what they want to do when they want to do it and and ultimately we're losing a lot of really good men to pornography and to this like hyper sexualized culture um so fa so father con is really to address the the con the lie that men are facing and also to really in to inspire them to have the conversations that really make life valuable conversations with your spouse or with your kids and then also the conference is really coming together so once a year we have a big conference 
um, just a gathering of all men from all different demographics to come together to celebrate fatherhood, um, to recognize the heart of the father. So, so we recognized three people who have exemplified, gone above and beyond as fathers. Um, this coming one is going to be in February, and we're having a Father Gregory Boyle is going to be the keynote speaker um, from Homeboy Industries. Um, it's going to be an incredible event coming up. And we just recently started, God, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long, huh? Um, so Father Khan, we just started doing these like film screenings at a movie theater on, on issues like human trafficking. The one that's coming up in September is on pornography and what our kids face online. So we're doing this in a theater, so it's a neutral environment. So it, it draws from a whole community to come in and then we can give a panel discussion and give a message to them about what we really hope for them. It's a very inspiring time. Things have really been kind of growing for us. Awesome. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, yes. Ken. It's always no, great to see you. Of you too, my brother. And I'll tell you guys, all these events are fantabulous. Like I have literally participated in every last one he has said. <laughs> um, he does a really, really great job with these things. And I just love the growth, how they continue to grow. And um, he already knows, I've told him this, I think in 2019 to be exact, and I'm pretty accurate with my dates, uh, <laughs> that FatherCon is going to be a national event. So um, I have faith and believe that Houston, Texas is going to be the next where the FatherCon is going to kick off. So I'll be trying to pray about that and I'll be trying to push him to that and uh, I'll encourage and help him to come to Houston. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a phenomenal and much needed event, guys. Um, all right. Thanks so much, Patrick. Now let's go to uh, Reverend Delman Howard. Good morning to everyone. My name's Delman Howard. I'm the pastor of Johnson Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Santa Anta, California. Mm -hmm. And I uh, am part of a black church uh, collaboration, uh, one of its newer members and um, working with Susan Patterson and with Kenny, um, trying to understand the issues uh, concerning uh, human trafficking and how it really impacts the black community and the brown community. Mm -hmm. um, our denomination, the Amy Church, one of its initiatives is to um, make aware within our denominations of over 7,000 churches worldwide uh, about the serious issue of human trafficking. Uh, I have a uh, smaller, older congregation. So it's kind of a, been a struggle trying to get them to be more concerned and more involved in the issues of, of this uh, horrific uh, issue that, that you are and I have been engaged in. So every opportunity I get to be a part of something like this, I'm, I'm, my desire is to take advantage of it and to learn and to share uh, with whom and uh, wherever I can about this, uh, this, horrific, um, this horrific situation in human trafficking that affects all of us. Awesome. Thank you, Reverend Delman. And thank you so much for being uh, transparent, too. And that, that's what's so awesome. Like, you know, like my grandmother always said, the squeaky wheel is the only one that gets the oil. Yeah. So, you know, when we, any challenges with this call, any challenges are very, very important, too. So that way we can address um, you know, if anyone have advice, you know, for you hear him say something like I have an older struggling church. Um, if anyone has seen success from that, you go in and share that, you know, at some point in the call. Um, so next let's go up to, let's go Mr. Joe Sullivan. Oh man. So I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a deacon in a Catholic church in Orange County, California. And, um, Mostly what I'm trying to do with, with our task force is, is find ways to get to groups of men and do a, a presentation we call in the demand is try to make um, men especially aware of what trafficking is and how they are the reason that trafficking exists, at least sex trafficking in our um, wealthy areas, if you will, our county is a demand center. So we try to impress people on what it is, what, why it keeps happening. And 
what they can do about it. Now, what they can do about it is gets difficult because it basically means going back to um, trying to do something about pornography and its impact on young people, really, really children, and and then realizing that it leads to sex purchasing and sex purchasing is not okay for these reasons, you know, all these myths that say it's okay. She, she wants to, she gets the money, all that kind of thing, none of which is true. So we try to gather groups of men. So the hard thing is to gather a group of men to talk about that because initially they don't want, why would I want to listen to that? So we have tried and my, my uh, church is an, is an older church, if you will. And so we try to say, you need to understand the impact on your, your adult children and your grandchildren, mm. that this evil is hunting for them and they're not immune to it just because you raised them well or whatever, you know, that it's, it's really hard for any families that are in a faith community really to understand how it could possibly be that they're kids are exposed to this kind of thing and yet it's everywhere and it's hunting for them so we, we try to gather and when we're talking to men it's you need to be the protector you need to understand and you need to talk to your your co-workers and your and your boys because this is happening and they're they're subject and they're going to end up being the ones who are perpetrators so anyway that's the effort it's hard to still it's hard to find the groups we're we're working we try to work through uh faith community gatherings uh you know multiple churches we have an interfaith council and we have diocesan meetings and it's like if you're please go out and ask your parish to let somebody come and talk to them and yeah it's slow but we we do gather a group occasionally (laughs) and then the the problem why i listen here and always with hope is so once they want to do something about it, what are they supposed to do? Mm-hmm. That's what we need. We Because if the men, you talk about leadership, if we see somebody who's who's on fire, wants to do something, they're ready to be a leader. What do we give them to do? You know, that'll keep them growing in it, interested. Once they get on to something else, we've probably lost the opportunity. So that's my ask, if you will. I'm always looking for what what can I give this group of guys to do that'll keep them involved and help them learn? So thanks for listening. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, and I'm writing these questions down, guys. So if we have time, we can address these uh, further in the meeting. So next, let's go to Mr. Alan Smith here. Ooh. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. I just joined. Pardon my my tardiness. Um, I had a couple of obstacles this morning that I had to overcome, but I'm here. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the question is because I didn't. Yeah, you, you just want to introduce yourself right now. Just an introduction, your name, uh, uh, title, and your uh, entity. Great. Uh, Alan Smith, uh, I'm the executive director of Saving Innocence, which is a anti-trafficking agency based in Los Angeles. And um, our specialty, our, our focus has been uh, the child victims of sex trafficking. But in this last year, we were appointed... Um, to co-lead the LA Trafficking Task Force, which means now we're doing all kinds of interesting trafficking cases and a lot of international smuggling rings and trafficking rings, those kinds of things we're in the middle of right now. So that's who I am. And just as part of the introduction, I just cut this a little bit of what was happening. Um, In all humility, I was able to collaborate with a number of survivors and we released a book called Men Fight For Me. And it's exactly focused on challenging men, encouraging men, letting them see things they haven't seen before um, and then answer the very question the gentleman said, like, what do I do? There's all kinds of, here's what you do next kinds of things. So I, I humbly submit that to the group. You can find it at fightforme.net, the little website we created. And it's specifically, it's a book, it's a book for everybody. Uh, it breaks down the issues and survivors are sharing their lives, but really it's my male voice challenging men to, to see it and live better and live stronger. So if that's helpful. Yes, fight for me. Thank you so much, Alan. All right. Now let's go to Dr. G. Williams here. Call him Dr. G. Dr. Gregory, as you guys say, it's our guy. Hey, good morning. It's great to be with you. I, I had no idea that this was a participant. Um, 
Webb, uh, an R, but I, I appreciate it. And Ken's one of my favorite people in this world. <laughs> I'm from uh, the, the most awesome city in the world, Houston, Texas. And, um, I work at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital. Uh, I manage, I'm the business manager of the uh, OB-GYN department, which is kind of a unique way, but I also am a certified Texas uh, human trafficking uh, trainer uh, for all the continued education that all of the medical professionals have to have now, which is an awesome thing that Texas, the state of Texas has required uh, for all the nurses, dentists, first responders, and uh, medical professionals, doctors to uh, have to have to keep their license up to date. So I'm one of those trainers. So I do those presentations, all probably five or six of those uh, a month. Um, I also pastor a church, not a very big church. We have about 800 members here in Houston. I am the senior minister, uh, senior pastor of that church. Uh, here is right on the outskirts of town uh, in Pearland. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love that. Um, I have written a couple books. I have one that just comes out, uh, matter of fact, Tuesday uh, in the hard copy, uh, When Dark Clouds Come for Teenagers and the Generation Zs, uh, basically the teenagers, 20s and 30s of how to deal with uh, issues, uh, depression, anxiety, stress, bullying, uh, those type of issues. Uh, but I think the main thing that I, I am proud of is that I am involved in the steering committee uh, with United Against uh, Human Trafficking here in Houston, along with Ken. And I love that role. And uh, probably my main interest is that I am a survivor uh, but more likely a champion uh, through human trafficking that my father sold me to uh, not only abuse me every day of my life up to my 17th birthday, but he uh, sold me on Monday evenings to his friends one right after another. And I didn't even realize I was being trafficked uh, until a, uh, like a year ago when I had a, a Victor through uh, human trafficking on my radio show and mentioned, well, Greg, I read your book. This is exactly what happened to you. And it, it hit home. And now I travel around the country and, and share about how to deal with overcoming abuse. And I have a book coming out in December called Hiding in Darkness, uh, the effects of overcoming uh, sexual abuse in men and boys. And I've been commissioned by uh, a large hospital in Cincinnati to write that book. So that'll, that'll hopefully come out in December. Awesome. Oh. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much, brother. And I'm awesome. so happy to have Greg here on the steering committee. I'm glad you said that because I was going to make sure we make mention. Um, yeah, so the steering committee, guys, with the coalition uh, here at, with United Against Human Trafficking, uh, we, you know, the steering committee is that governing committee that runs the, uh, it help really runs the day-to-day -day of the entire coalition. And that coalition here uh, that we have is really huge in Houston. Um, and so it's that role as a, the, the chair of the steering committee is very vital. So I literally was like praying who would be the right person for this. I was looking, I was, you know, having one-on-ones with people. And I mean, just every encounter I had with this guy, it just literally, it said, and I was like, he's so busy. I just don't even think, I, I said, but I'm going to pray for this. <laughs> um, and it was so amazing, you know, when we finally, you know, got it and it was just the right fit and he felt the same way he wanted to do it. And it's just been amazing. So we're so happy to have you, Dr. G, and so happy to have you on this call to meet our other fantastic people. Um, so let's go now to our other, let's stay with Houston. Let's, and we're in the spirit of UAHT. So let's talk to Mr. Taylor. One of our awesome uh, shining stars over at UHD. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Taylor. I'm the Outreach and Prevention Coordinator with United Against Human Trafficking. Um, I've been with UAHT for three and a half years now. Um, in my current role, kind of what's re relevant to everyone here, I teach a class called Stopping Sexual Exploitation, which is a pre-trial intervention program for men who are purchasers of sex. Um, the majority, overwhelming majority of them have had an arrest related to buying sex. Um, so the class is intended to really challenge the norms uh, that dictate um, the reason that the reasons that men buy sex. Um, it's really a challenge to like look at those and kind of deconstruct them and uh, pick them apart. And we try to talk about new ways of relating to ourselves and to the people that we're close to and then to others who we're who are in um 
more vulnerable positions than those who we know are typical sex buyers, um, married, middle class. Um, so yeah, it's my favorite thing in the entire world. Uh, something that's been really affirming for me to hear is that I'm not the only one who feels kind of like alone as a man kind of doing this work. I feel like a couple other people have said, you know, like, it's really surprising to have a group like this because we've all been doing the work, but then it's like, it feels sometimes like a, I have a Dixie cup and I'm trying to empty out a pool. So uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can get some buckets and there can be multiple of us with buckets. So absolutely. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate no, thank, it. Thank you, Taylor. And Taylor, do you mind sharing a little bit about, cause you're also, um, you know, do the real talk. Yeah. Um, it's part of my role also is uh, identifying individuals who are currently experiencing trafficking or who have experienced trafficking. Um, one of the ways that I do that is we have a program called Real Talk, which is a trauma-informed supportive service designed originally for youth who have experienced trauma, um, but we've expanded into more adult populations, adult jails, substance use recovery facilities, uh, places like that. Uh, it really centers around educating uh, people about trauma in the brain, coping skills, relationships, um, and then of course, talking about human trafficking and trying to identify people that we can connect with uh, resources through our case management program, which we also have. You're muted, Ken. Awesome. Me. Okay, yeah, I gotta mute myself. So now let's go to Miss, uh, staying in Houston, Texas here. Let's go to Mr. C.J. Joseph extraordinaire, Mr. Walker, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Grand rising, good people. I am CJ Joseph. I am a professional actor. I'm over here in Houston, really rich in Richmond, right outside of Houston. And how I got involved with the HT is being a moderator for a traveling symposium that Ken is also a panelist on. And so we kicked off in Houston initially on back in June and then we, no, excuse me, May. Um, and then we traveled to Baltimore in the, the early part of June. And then our next um, trip is to New York for, um, we're praying for a big event there. So basically um, my my goal here is just to, to listen, observe, um, so I can continue to learn, continue to um, try to hone my skills and questions and things of, of that nature dealing with the the panel and to make sure um, I ask appropriate questions and things of that nature. Thank you, uh, CJ. Yes, you do a great job moderating. Um, and, I, and I love it because you take it very serious learning um, this movement, uh, learning from folks. And uh, so that's this is why it's so great. I knew this call would be very, very beneficial for you as well. Um, and then, so if case anyone wants to watch you on, um, as Mr. Walker, can you tell us how we can do that? <laughs> so then I know how to do it. I, uh, I, I have a recurring co-star role on CW's hit show called Walker starring Jared Padalecki. Um, we're in, well, they just recently started filming again, but I've been to season one and season two on um, several episodes and I pr uh, portray, um, the principal of Jared's, um, his kid's high school as principal Sam Haney. Yes, Mr. Haney. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Um, all right. Let's go now to Bro Mohammed. Are you there, Mr. B? Okay. Let's see. Is he muted? Yeah, so maybe stepped away. Okay, so then what we'll do, let's just go in right into it, guys. So um, Alan and Bro Mohammed, I think you guys are the only ones not on here. So basically the call today, the theme is just going to be on leadership. And, you know, all you guys are leading in uh, very effective ways and different areas, as we all just heard. So what we want to talk about is, and I think this is great. I uh, love that Reverend Howard started out sharing um you know about some of the challenges he he's having in uh, specifically with the ch getting the church uh, moving with an older church, yeah. older congregation, a smaller church. I love that Joe also shared. You know, how do you help these passionate men come in that want to get going right away if you don't have anything right away? Um, so when we talk about leadership, I'm going to ask us some series of questions, and we'll just address those. And anyone um, you know can jump in. We'll do one at a time. But then uh, to go ahead, maybe raise your hand if you can do the emoji. And I can see that, then I can um, call you in order. But the first thing is, 
let's let, let's let's ask this this general question that is very very important. Why do you think in this movement that leadership and not just leadership, right? Anyone you put anybody in a leader role, but why is it that effective leadership as a man specifically is vital in this movement? So why is male leadership, effective male leadership, vital in this movement? Who would like to 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 say that first? Okay, Taylor. Uh, one reason that I think leadership for men can be important is because from like the, the demand reduction side of things, um, buyers are overwhelmingly men. Um, perpetrators a lot of times are men. Um, so for that reason and the simple fact that people are more likely to listen to people that are like them. Um, something that I've found through SSE in talking with um, you know, a year's worth of buyers is, you know, one question that I ask sometimes is, if there was a woman who was teaching the class, would that change the way that y'all arrive and the way that y'all process and the way that y'all talk about things? And uh, most of the time I hear yes. Um, so I'm really, that's kind of what I was saying earlier. It's just, it's really affirming to see more men that are able to reach out and connect to other men in a way that only kind of we can. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like using that for good instead of, uh, I think a lot of society, the ways that men connect with each other are unhealthy um, and it's more of a competition than anything else. So uh, once again, just, I'm really happy to be here and I appreciate all you. No, that's great. Thank you, Taylor. That's very great. Cause uh, I mean, I know honestly myself as a man, uh, just the way I was reared, I definitely would not be comfortable talking about, uh, you know, sexual things in front of a, a woman I don't know. I'll just be very honest. Um, there's only so far we'll go. So I think that's a very good point. Uh, anyone else? Patrick? Yeah. And then we'll do Alan. Sorry, Alan, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick, I, I'll be happy to follow you. <laughs> I'll, follow, I'll follow you anywhere. Um, <laughs> I think I think two twofold. I think it's important for women to see that men are standing up um, and and taking this seriously because you know in talking to survivors, so many of them felt like every every guy's a customer and and that's just kind of what they believed. Um, and so there there needs to be a disruption of the things that are that have been normalized. So for men also, it's you know we 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 have this steady diet of how we're entitled and how you know everyone's doing it. And that needs to be disrupted by us, you know, and, and people standing up and saying, you know, this is this is not normal and this doesn't really get you to where you want to be as a man. Um, to me, that's, you know, in, in first getting involved in this, it was really like the men were being so demonized because it was so it was it was such a women driven, um, you know, confrontation of this evil. Um, and so there was this there was this kind of spirit of just these evil men or, you know, like doing these horrible things to children and, and to people and and my feeling was we really need to see the men are being groomed also to become buyers and we have to really disrupt that you know through more and more men taking leadership to do that alan yeah i, I would say really a combination of what both of those guys just said in our work at saving innocence uh, the buyers are almost exclusively men i know there's women involved and the sellers the traffickers almost exclusively men they may be controlling some women to be on their team but it's mostly men and it just requires men to push against men and we got to have the hard conversations uh man to man um not to in any way take anything away from all the amazing awesome phenomenal women that are already doing it but the missing ingredient for the cake we're trying to bake is men we need more men to there and the other thing is a little more nuanced um, that i've seen at saving innocence mostly women that i work with colleagues and then again working with mostly um you know f female young young girls is that um part of what patrick was saying men have been demonized in some way and and we have an opportunity as men to change the narrative. So job one is to straighten out all us men. And, but the, the thing that comes with that is we get an opportunity, amazing privilege to change the narrative. I've heard so many things, like it's not on my job description to bring healing and emotional healing to the women I work with per se. Like that's not written, written in the job description, but I've heard over and over and over again that 
their time working at Saving Innocence. I haven't done anything spectacular. I've just been a guy who wasn't trying to buy them and abuse them in some way. You know, I don't think I've done anything spectacular, but I've heard over and over again what a healing experience it's been to be around some men. Now there's a few of us. They're actually good men. Look them in the eye, say thank you and please, and not doing anything, don't want anything in return. So I wouldn't undersell that. Um, that doesn't necessarily end sex trafficking, but it provides a level of healing that none of us, I think, will fully understand. And I just know that it's there and I've seen it. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Alan and Patrick, for that. Um, and Patrick, like, well, I'll, go, I'll start from the end. You know, Alan. I think, I think uh, Dr. Greg, Dr. G oh, wants to say something. Oh, where is he? Oh, I don't want, I can't see him right now. Oh, there we go. Dr. Just, G. Just short. Uh, no, take your time, bro. Being, being a, a survivor of it. I, I have seen, <clears throat> at least in my world, sex is an unbelievable, powerful drug. And uh, I, I think men need to, to be able to, to realize that, that when they're involved in it, there's a hook that goes so deep that it changes the mentality of those people that are involved that would have never done this if they would have been told years ago, would you ever get involved in this? And there has to be a, there's a process that drags them into it. And, you know, the ones that I was being abused by was the chief of police in our town, uh, the state's attorney in our town, uh -huh. some popular, powerful people. And exposing that uh, was their greatest fear. And I, I think the men need to also be told in our leadership of this, there's a way out. You don't have to, to fall into this. And not that I'm, I'm standing up for the, the ones that abuse, I'm not, but I, that they need help. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the availability, especially in Houston, I can go right across the street and get it right now for a $10 bill. Mm -hmm. And it probably wouldn't even cost me $10. Uh, if I wanted to buy it. Uh, and it, it's just so readily available. And we have to have a leadership that I think Ken is probably leading here in Houston that is, we have to expose that it's everywhere in every community. I'm on the, and I'm sad, I'm, I'm heartbroken to say this. In my pastoral position, I'm in the Southern Baptist denomination. I am ashamed of what our denomination is doing right now. And I'm on the committee that exposed this uh, in the Southern De Baptist denomination. Uh, it, it's everywhere. And uh, that, that drug of sex is really uh, unbelievably powerful. And it needs to be, it needs to be shut down uh, in every way that we possibly can. Right, awesome, man, awesome. You know, and the only the only way to do it, honestly, is to you know really understand that it it, it needs you have to be healed and delivered from it to really be true. Um, you know, all these other things that we're doing is you know we're patching up and we are we're medicating. You know, we are managing managing it. But the, the root, what we're doing right here on this call, and the things that we're talking about, and the things that you guys are getting involved in on all these capacities, right? Even CJ, who's over here moderating, taking time out of his day. But just being a male, his presence as being a, a, a man, you know, of the word, a man of integrity, a great husband, um, and being there and, and traveling, just that presence makes a major difference. You know, and Patrick, when I look at you and all the things, you know, we met years ago at the Long Beach Task Force to see all these, how God has used you to elevate you with the different movements, you know, from, you know, men standing against trafficking and then going into the Law of the Con and the See It Ended Film Festival. I mean, and you've been able to mobilize and pull in a lot of men um, through this from different backgrounds, from the arts. And I think that's, you know, everybody has a major, major power here, everything that we're doing. And it's so unique is why I get excited about this call. Um, because I think you are those examples. And what Alan said is very, very powerful. I think as soon as I got in the movement in 2013, I realized that within a year that, wow, we make a difference just having a presence here, just being a man here that want nothing but the best for them, that speaks life into them. Uh, that is powerful. And I've seen, you know, being, I started out as case management, you know, and seeing survivors thrive under just being with a male because you have to think many times 
many survivors, uh, whether it's male or female, like and Dr. Greg is a prime example of this. It doesn't matter about social economic status, educational level, but many of them didn't have great role models in their actual yeah. fathers. Yeah. And that's what they first learned about men and what who men were. And so I'm looking at a screen full of phenomenal men that has answered a call that could be doing anything else with their talents and gifts, but choosing to have a presence here. This is powerful. And so um, I want us to keep encouraging each other, uplifting each other. But this is a great example of leadership here, of effective leadership, you know, in all of you. Anyone else want to add, you know, what do you think? Because uh, I, th I mean, I think you guys are hitting it on the nail for sure. But anyone else would love to add, like, what is it to be? you know, positive male role in this HT movement? Or do you feel like the other guys have uh, said it all? Another quick thought. How, how can we do this without God? Yeah. I, hate, I hate to put that down, but yes. I'm not ashamed to put that down because without God, we can't do any of this. Mm -hmm. And that's the only right. thing that kept me alive through all of this is my belief in God and that he would get me through it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, we stand back away from that. And, you know, Kim, we don't get to do that much with you, HT. Mm -hmm. I don't get to do Baylor College of Medicine. But mm -hmm. when I get in front of the church people and I get to preach, man, without God, this is an impossible task. Mm -hmm. Amen, uh, brother. May, may I, may I oh. say, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Reverend Darrell. We'll may I say it. that a lot of this is cultural and what society has uh, placed upon men. Um, there are certain roles that we're expected to show up in and take a stand. Mm -hmm. And yet there are other roles that we because of the lack in some uh, situations did not have, as Ken was talking about, positive role models to, to learn, men learn from men. And uh, I know in the African-American community that that remains a struggle and an issue. Yeah. Um, we have a tendency in, in, in our community to, to be uh, missing in action. And it has affected uh, our families. And when we talk about issues of sex and um, human trafficking, uh, we shy away from that. Um, it uh, it hasn't been something that that our families, like many other families, have taken the time to say, this is the po the positive example of what a father. Uh, sex relationship should be and, and understand that. And then I, I go back to Dr. Williams that uh, because of the word of God, that God created man and man's role is to take leadership uh, over his family, to take leadership in the community, to take leadership wherever we're at. No, you're muted, Ken. Thank you, brother. So you, and actually you started something because the next question deals with that cultural competency. So what we're going to do is come back to Patrick because I, I think you wanted to respond to um, that first question. And then I'm going to ask that question on the cultural competency so we can kind of pick up where Reverend um, Howard left. So I love okay. that. I just wanted to say that, you know, we sometimes diminish, you know, being a good husband and being a, a good father to your kids yeah. Like this one, that's not enough, but actually that's really where um, so much of the prevention comes from is, uh, you know, Alan, Alan's book really, really moved me. Um, the one part when he talked about preparing to become a father, you know, like with his friends and, and sitting together and like, wh what are our kids going to need us to be? Mm -hmm. And I think we really, we need to have those conversations with young guys who are not fathers yet, like to start thinking, because if, if we can, if we can, realize the impact that it has on our kids by the type of husband we are the type of of that how much what we're modeling in our love for our spouse is going to really impact our kids and protect them in ways that all the devices on your phone can't can't do and and so i think as as we want to do something we want to do something that's going to prevent this from happening that's a really tangible thing that's right in front of us you know what can i do to demonstrate a, a love for my my spouse what, what can, you know, how can I turn that into prevention of human trafficking? Like, 
and, and then that spreads out. I think within the black community, what I've seen is the 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 in the in the black community, the fathers who really get it are the are the best dads. They're just these amazing guys that are committed to their families. Um, and 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 we need that we need that modeling more. So to really make it public, you know, that you know how we're taking care of our kids and our families to really to make that something that other people can see and and look up to. Anyway, that's you know that's what that's fabulous. Uh so <laughs> this is great, Patrick, because also you talked a little bit about this next question. So the next question is how effective, um, and then how do you kind of see that show up in your your work as well? Is cultural competency as a leader in this movement and meaning so culture is not just race and and the reason why uh, Patrick kind of talked about you know the book that that, that part in uh, Alan's book where he talked about he, there was a culture that Alan was a part of where they had they created space to talk about these things and share some of the fears and maybe concerns of like hey you know what would it take to be a great dad um, so culture comes in race culture comes in the community uh, lifestyle but as men here leaders in this fight how important and I think Taylor, I think you could speak to this for sure, because uh, you deal with so many different um, folks from different backgrounds all the time. Um, how important is cultural competency as a, a, a leader in this movement? Who'd like to go take that first? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, just because Houston, I, like I can speak from my own experience. Um, Houston is the most diverse city in the country. Um, part of the reason when I was talking earlier about um, who the buyers are, I was pretty intentional about the language that I was using, which qualifiers I used, mm -hmm. uh, because I think Houston is a little different than maybe other parts of the country where buyers are predominantly married, um, middle income, average income, uh, uh, median income, uh, and white. Um, that hasn't been the case with the Houston area, uh, specifically um, with race. So I've had to learn a lot about different cultures. Um, I've had a couple of guys that were from uh, countries in Africa, uh, countries in the Middle East. Um, in my upcoming group, there's a couple of people of Asian descent. So it's really interesting kind of learning um, how those different cultures what their human trafficking and prostitution, like what those landscapes look like, it's pretty different from here. And they bring really interesting insights to uh, the conversation. Um, and then we've kind of danced, not danced around it a little bit, but it's almost been mentioned. Um, women are buyers sometimes too. And like, when you're faced with that, it's like, whoa, whoa like, what do we, what do we do here? It's such a different conversation. Um, and that's one that I'll hopefully be engaging in soon um fingers crossed but yeah. yeah thank you no taylor thank you so much because that's uh so so you know with that it sounds like you have if i am not misinterpreting it sounds like you know you've really had to become a student with a lot of these cultures and i i think we can understand why because houston is one of those where you know it's still texas so it's a strong economy you know and low cost of living so people there's a lot more accessible money for all folks so I think that's probably why we see a lot of the buyers looking, you know, different races and communities and that thing. But I would imagine that has made you have to really um, just sit back and uh, learn a lot from a lot of these cultures. You had had like maybe the Middle Eastern culture, um, because that's a whole different, um, you know, I have tons of Middle Eastern friends. So it's that's a whole different culture here in America. Um, and they're very strong at keeping that culture as, a, as well, not assimilating to American culture too much um do you is that accurate yeah i mean i've definitely learned to sit back um not to you know i'm a social worker is my background so i've had a little bit of preparation for kind of yeah. being in that space but you know one thing that i've found to be really useful is just ask a hundred questions mm -hmm. i just want to know like i'm just curious 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 i want to know where you're coming from and how you got there and where you want to be and how we can get there that's kind of the approach that i take Okay, awesome. Joe? And yeah, let me ask you a question. When you first said cultural competency, and then the, as we start talking about it, I'm, I'm wondering if it means that, I don't think this is it, but do I need to stick with people like me? 
<laughs> so that I can talk about this stuff? Or, I mean, what are we talking about here? Thank you. It is, it's an interesting point that um, if it's something I don't understand what's going on, I, I, I wouldn't want to start, you know, giving instructions or whatever. But, but just um, when it comes to sharing oh, kind of a yeah. basic, basic thing that we're called to be this and this is what's going to defeat us, you know, take us away from being husbands, fathers, you know, sex purchasing is not good for her, but it's not good for you either. And, you know, I would think it would cross cultures, but I'm kind of wondering if you've learned that, or, you know, you kind of need to make sure you really know the people you're talking to first um, might narrow the audience maybe, but I just kind of wonder if that's what I wonder if you think that matters, that I shouldn't talk about, and maybe it's true, I shouldn't assume, I shouldn't assume that a guy, until I know he, I know who he is, I don't know, you know, what I should be talking to him about, but I guess I'm just wondering, is that, should we be cautious and feel a little more yeah, cautious, limited before we talk, or What's cultural competency? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Joe. No, honestly, mean. I guess that's what the question is. But. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that's good. That was a good question. That's what these times are about. Exactly. And thanks for your uh, your humility, honestly. Um, so it is actually the contrary. It is the contrary of just staying in your lane and staying in your community that you know. It is um, like what Taylor was talking about, dealing with folks from different backgrounds, because that's how you're going to learn. You know, I think that when you look at our country in 2022 and while we've always continue to have these issues of race um, and, 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 you know, discrimination and things of that nature, you would think we'd be so far removed from that as a country, you know, as diverse as America. But one of the biggest issues is because people are not having those conversations, those difficult conversations and learning from each other and seeking to understand. There's so much uh, assuming I know what's best and I get it. And, and, and the problem is they don't because we have cultures within cultures. As I look at the screen and I have relationships with <laughs> everyone on here for the most part. And I can tell you, just looking at the screen, every white man is not the same. Every black man is not the same, <laughs> every Hispanic. So it's about experiences. And so um, that's what cultural competency means is just really getting co as competent as possible, as knowledgeable as possible with different people from different backgrounds. And so I asked Taylor specifically, because I know with his uh, real talk and with the uh, the sex buying class, he's faced with so many men, different cultures, especially here in, um, you know, in the Houston, well, in the Houston area. And then he deals with, you know, real talk with women as well. And so with that, you have to, you know, as well as asking, does he have to learn a lot? Because I mean, I feel like, you know, I've lived in Los Angeles 20 years and now being here in, you know, Houston and, I have probably been, I've lived in two of the most diverse cities in the America. And so for me, I have the privilege of having friends from different backgrounds, every country you can imagine for the most part, but I'm, I still learn so much and we have deep relationships. And I ask like Taylor a lot of questions because I want to learn. And I learned even from that, like I've been the guy who has attended mosque on purpose to go in with my friends and see what their worship looks like. I'm not one of those Christians that want to demonize. And, you know, I don't believe in that. I think that's completely wrong. Um, I love, you know, and so for me, I've learned all Islamic folks are different as well. They're not all the same, just like all Christians are not the same. And so uh, when we are faced with these buyers, or um, our survivors, you know, and overcomers in trafficking, they're going to come from different backgrounds. There'll be male, female, there'll be transgender, there'll be some from LGBT community. I mean, and so we have to really, if we want to do a great job and be responsible, all we're saying is don't be cautious. I don't like that word. I think be respectful, which should be very easy for us as Christian men. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, this is going to go back even to the first question about m men leaders. We have male leaders in our world i think sports you know athletes those are leader people look to them want to be like them you know there's there's all kinds of leaders already out there who are male and a lot of times the what the what seems to be in the soul or rejoiced in is not is not good and it's and so in a way we're needed partly to to be a counter to that maybe but also it means there are things that cross cultures. We all love 
sport excitement. I mean, we all, there's things we all respond to. And um, so I, I guess I thank you. Respectful is a great way to put it rather than cautious. I think if I, if I could add um, just one other thing, I think part of cultural competency is just curiosity, like without trying to learn, you're never going to get there. You have to be willing and, and able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and just kind of wipe your slate clean, throw away any assumptions you might have made about a particular group or a particular person. Um, but beyond that, like, I think the question was that, that Mr. Sullivan asked was like, well, do we stay kind of in our area and, and do that? Or do we go totally to a different? I think it's a mix of both. I think you have to like try to find a way to blend those together. So maybe you come over here and then you report back what you found with kind of your normal group, or you try to bring people from this space in over here in a way where they can communicate what their experiences are like. And you try to bridge some of those gaps. Um, I don't know, that was on my mind. I wanted to, I wanted to say that. That was a great point, Taylor, honestly. Anyone else wanna add anything? Alan? Ken, I would just say, I, I, I mean, I love the idea of being culturally competent and in the sense that you're using it. And I think that's helpful and necessary and all those things. Um, in terms of when I speak to men and men's groups or a, a podcast focused on men or whatever it might be, um, I take a slightly different approach um, with the idea that all of us as men are part of a culture. I'm not thinking about in, a, in an ethnicity sense. We're, we're, part of a, we're part of a rape culture. We're part of an over-sexualized culture, regardless of where your background's coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I usually take it from that approach. And just to make it real practical, um, I, I talk to men about step number one, like, what do I do? How can I be part of this? Okay, let's, have a, let's change the world, but we'll do one baby step at a time. It starts with you looking in the mirror. And the challenge is that us men have to make our life internally in sync with a non-exploitive culture, the kind of culture we want our daughters to grow up in. So start right there. Mm -hmm. Start with you looking in the mirror and we have a conversation about pornography and Friday night to strip clubs and, and jokes and memes and, and all the different things that kind of shape this culture that we as men either are actively participating in or passively allowing it to happen right under our nose. And so let's take from that approach and in the middle of it, bring in the cultural competency that you're speaking of but um, we're all in a bigger culture, if you will, that's sick and unhealthy. And we need to challenge all men to live different and rise up and, and then go back to your communities and, and put the context on top of that. It's something that comes to my mind anyway. No, absolutely. That's fantastic. So if I hear you uh, correctly, Alan, so you're saying that uh, helping everyone find that common ground first, seeing that we're all, we can relate here as men because of this particular culture. That's uh, right. And then move from, yeah, absolutely. 100% agree, 100% agree with that. Patrick, I think, yeah. I would just kind of piggyback on that. And the, the thing that I try to emphasize is, is the sense of entitlement that's constantly being thrown at us, whether it's in advertising or politics, or I mean, all the time we're getting hit with this messaging of you deserve this and you deserve that. And I, and I think as the society becomes, you know, hypersexualized, there's, there's this sense that I deserve to have this kind of awesome sexual experience. And, and it's, and you have this, ubiquitous 24 seven in your face uh, pornography access so whenever you're struggling you can you can go to that but but we're we're being fed this kind of sense of entitlement that i'm entitled to this kind of you know the, the sexual fulfillment that that i see happening in in pornography and and then that creates a sense that if i don't have that then someone's preventing me from having it whether it's my wife or my girlfriend or you know whoever it is but but i'm being kept from something that i'm entitled to and then that that causes us to be unable to be grateful it, it completely derails our sense of gratitude which is actually where our where our our pathway to happiness is and our connection to god is um so it derails gratitude and then it justifies so then we feel this justification if i'm being kept from something i deserve or i'm entitled to then i'm just by god i'm going to go take it and so there's this whole push then to to justify you know behavior that if you really sat back and looked at yourself in the mirror you wouldn't abide by but I think, I think like really, really dealing with this sense of entitlement, it's all around us and men have to do that. We have to disrupt that. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm entitled to is, is to really be the best 
the best husband, the best father I can be, and the best example for others, because children are looking and, and they're going to follow the example that they see. Absolutely. Good job. You, you know, I, I think, uh, Patrick, I, I agree with that. When I, when I speak to men's groups all around the, the country, uh, and, and one of the reasons I think it's not that I'm a, a good speaker or not, it's the fact that I'm a man that has gone through it. And there's not too many of us out there talking about it. And every time I present an avenue to receive freedom from it, there's a line of people that want to talk to me afterwards. I don't think it's, it may be amongst all of us. Hell, there's all kinds of groups you can go to. But I don't think on the street, there's an awareness that there's places of safety that men can go to to receive help in a zone of uh, protection of, hey, I can be who I am with a group of men and tell my battles to. And to me, I think that is such a huge uh, hurdle that we're gonna have to come over yeah. uh, to try to allow uh, the key to release the bondage that so many people are in that are slaves to sex. Uh, and there's not that many places that I know of uh, that are a place that they can go and feel a comfort zone of sharing, hey, this is the battles that I'm in. I don't know how to overcome my addictions. I don't know how to overcome those feelings that drives me deep within. Um, and I, I think that's a, a huge uh, problem that we need to overcome. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. That's yeah, very, very true, bro. I know um, there was a church I know in, they had a program. I don't know if it's still there in California, actually, uh, in Mariner's Church. I don't know if they, Patrick, do you know if that's still happening, the Rogue program? I haven't heard. I don't okay. Because I thought that was phenomenal. I had a, we had a meeting that day with uh, the guy who ran that. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's a great model. That's the kind of thing that I feel like, especially, you know, movements can have, whether it's churches or organizations, um, a safe place in that way to get to the root, because that's getting to the root, what you're talking about, Dr. Greg. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big man of the root. <laughs> like, even when we talk about the culture comes to why I threw that in there, because there, that, that is very, very um, relevant. And, you know, when Dr. Howard talked about, you know, well, the, the, you know, what we have in the Black community, we're seeing some progression, but here's where that gap is. Well, there's a root to that. It's not because they're black <laughs> that it's just all of a sudden, right? Because we see we have absent white fathers, absent Hispanic fathers, but why is it so prevalent? Well, then you have to get all into historical trauma and see how that plays a role in the psychological and conditioning of a, a people. And then when you throw in different type of, you know, systemic racism systems and things that, that was putting to oppress and hold people back, right, to create a certain mindset. Right. And then so you have to get to the root of those things and you can't be apologetic about it and tiptoe around it or we're never going to be able to really heal. So that's why I think it's very, very important, because although for me, I work with everyone, everyone knows that of every race, shade, I have a major, major passion for working with the black community because it, that's the community I understand a lot. And I see the strengths, but also see the weaknesses and the challenges. And I've done a lot of study on historical trauma and how that shows up. Right. And I think that we have to do that within our communities. Um, but I'm still I'm always there learning from the Hispanic community, from the Asian community. I mean, my wife is, you know, a specific Islander. I mean, I'm always learning from different communities because that's what I'm put here to do. I'm put here to love the Lord. I'm put here to love people and call people to the knowledge of him. Right. And I do that through my testimony. And that's done through my example when, with everything that I do. And so I, I think that it's amazing. Um, that we can come here, sit here and learn. Even here, we have opportunity to get cultural competency, you know, with the different things we do with work, um, with our lifestyles uh, and, you know, even culture, you know, uh, race. So those are some great, great answers. Um, I know we have a lot of work to do. I'll tell you that uh, I, I do feel hopeful in the Black community. I see a lot of, especially with the entertainment industry now, um, you're starting to, you know, I just came from Hollywood for a big film um, screening that these big producers did on um on sex trafficking and uh here it is just wanted to bring awareness they're waking up and their goal was they wanted the entertainment industry to wake up to this and see how they perpetuate it but we have to be honest you know my culture has been leading in this creating this culture 
and perpetuating this rave culture with this hip hop and the the content and you know the kind of songs that are getting Grammys. Like I tell all my hoes, rake it up, you know, rake up the money, call them women. You know, we've gotten comfortable and we're a very influential culture. Let's be very honest about it all around the world. And so now you're seeing people of all races, you know, pick up these things. And so we have to be responsible for that and be able to call it what it is. So anytime I get a chance to speak to a room of my people, I go, I make sure I go, I'm very honest (laughs) about it. And it's always received well because I think they get, it's out of love. And I want us to heal and progress, right? But we got to be able to call it out. So my next question is, what about, let's talk about some, when we talk about uh, leadership, what are some of those things, let's start with like roadblocks. And maybe you've seen it or you're feeling it right now. Like I I feel like, um, Reverend Howard, you shared yours, but maybe it's something else you want to say. Um, what's some of those roadblocks that you feel um, as a male, male leader in this in this movement? Um, you know, that's kind of like a consistent thing for you right now. In, anybody want to share that? And then we'll share what are those, some of those factors that are helping produce great progress as a male leader. I, I, I thank uh, Kenny and to the other uh, men and women who may be listening uh, for the African-American community and perhaps others. It's, is uh, uh, after our own struggle in raising our own family, And uh, once we have done that and got the children from elementary school to high school and even to college, then it's kind of we don't necessarily want to reinvest ourselves into other community issues such as human trafficking. Uh, I hear that, you know, why should I get involved? I've been a good parent. uh, good father, good mother, and I raised my kids. So I don't necessarily want to take or be engaged in, in something like that. Let somebody else take that responsibility. I've done my job. Yeah, that is a, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, I have, a, I, I definitely would love to talk to those folks, but, <laughs> but that is, <laughs> um, Joe. Well, just to add to being tired, if you will, there's so many other things that invite our our passion, our attention. Now, there's other injustices that also need working on, and so that's yeah. that's part of it. And, and finding people to walk with you is it's hard because there's other good things they're trying to address. So I, that was the thing I was going to add. That's no, that's that's phenomenal, and I think honestly that that's kind of helps you too, uh, Devin, How- Devin uh, Howard, because yes, um, really true that my approach to trafficking, and you know, Dr. G, witness to this, everyone who knows me, um, you know, collaboration is my middle name, <laughs> and um, I collaborate with folks that are, have missions of all type. As long as I feel that it can be effective with HT, whether that is economic empowerment, whether that's different with different policies um, and, and legislature whether that is just a basic education with language or whether it's actual tangible survivor services. Um, I, trust me, when I look across, that's one of my gifts. I can see collaboration. I can see where, and so you have to help folks connect the dots. So we have to connect it first to where we can see, wow, this is prevention. Like, you know, when I looked at the film company that came here, prime example, IO agency, they came here and uh, they're both originally the director and producer are from Houston. But they met in Los Angeles. They've done work together. They you know, made major success with shows and things. And so they realized human trafficking, the, the female producer said, hey, I realized I was around this and I didn't know what that was. I feel like I want to write a short film about this, but we need to find out survivors and, get, and you know do it right. They did that, came here, did six different days, six different beautiful venues um, and had us a, a lived experience person on each panel and someone who works in the field. So I happened to be uh, pulled in to do the last one. It was phenomenal. So then their goal was to go to Los Angeles to do the big one, just one big one that would be all like the celebrities, influencers and all that. So I told them, I said, listen, I initiated that. I said, what you guys are doing is phenomenal. I said, because you're helping us. I said, you had nothing but heart, no experience with HT and you have heart and you're using your gifts and talents to bring awareness to a movement that helps us to get that to the masses. I am obligated to do what I can. So I have a huge network in LA. Let me know if I can be of any assistance. 
that led to us getting on a Zoom call, that led to me helping them get the, the lived experience person that was going to be on the panel. Me, they wanted me to come in my, um, be a panelist again, but I ended up also moderating. But then I also helped them get a wine tasting company there. You know what I mean? I used my resources to help make it, their thing beautiful, and their event was amazing. It was be, like amazing. But here it is. This is that was prime example of collaboration. You look, oh, film directors, HC. What does that have in common, right? No, it has a lot in common. So this, you know, we look at educators. The educators are educating our children. Children are being recruited in the schools, mm -hmm. right? Counselors. You look at medical physicians. What Dr. G is teaching them all the time. You know, they're sometimes some of the people that will get survivors. And uh, before we would even see them before, you know what I mean? Because they've been abused and been hurt. Um, there's everywhere you look, in my opinion, there's a connection to HT, whether it's prevention or whether it is, you know, aftercare. There is always that when you look at businesses, you talk about economic empowerment. That's why our coalition, I'm like, and Dr. G is a witness to this. I've been changing that majorly. We will not be a coalition of just, um, you know, nonprofits. We need to have business owners in here because who can provide job opportunities and have these partnerships with us to have yeah. internships and training programs? It is business owners. So they also, they they fit. So we just have to be able to make sure we're doing our due diligence um, and always taking inventory to make sure we can connect the dots. So when we connect the dots, that helps us be very effective. We're pulling in the right collaborators and, um, and the right partners, right? Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure Alan, for sure, uh, Patrick has done a great job of that um, with his, with the different events. I've seen it that he's put on, Alan being an ED, you know, of a nonprofit specifically in this, he's had to do that, you know, um, to, for, as, for his donors to whatever it may be. So just thinking about that and then talking to folks like the lady or, or gentleman you, you talked to, Reverend Howard, uh, why does it affect me? Well, it may, you may have been blessed and your children were fortunate enough to not be caught up. But you may have grandchildren or right. you may have nieces and nephews that uh, will not be so fortunate, right? Um, those are the kind of things that they need to understand how there is a circle, a full circle, right? And by the time it hits your family, you don't want it to hit your family. It's too late now at this point. So your goal is get involved now. If you're so blessed, be a blessing to other folks to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. So um, I think helping folks understand that. All right, guys. So we are uh, wrapping up. So the, uh, we have one more question. I want you guys to answer. This has been great. Uh, the last one is the opposite. What are some of those factors that you guys are seeing that you feel ha are being like major, making major progress? It's helping you make progress maybe in your day to day or think generally the overall movement of HT as a male leader. What factors you think are playing a role that's helping us make major progress? And you can't say this, even though this is one of them, this call engaging man. <laughs> right. I'll go first quickly, awareness. Okay, awareness in what way? Having an open communication and not being ashamed to say it happens here. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, doctors, the doctors see it every day of their work week. I really truly believe it. They have somebody in their office out of 30 people that they see every day in the ob -gen, I believe every doctor sees at least one. Uh, mm -hmm. person that, but they don't want to see it. They don't want to take the scales off their eyes and admit it's happening to people that they may be aware of and know. And mm -hmm. I think awareness is a key of, of showing them what to look for and then have an open communication uh, that it's better to not only to see it, but be a champion to our community and help stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see, we drive by it every day, but not only be aware, but be a part of the solution and become a champion in it. Love that. I love that. Okay, next, anyone else? Kenny, I do see a lot more, um, you said you can't talk about things like this, but it's true, things like this, but also there's a lot of podcasts and radio shows and there's a lot more people talking about it than a few years ago there ever was and that's a good thing sadly i have a lo much longer list of roadblocks um there's a movement 
that's gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of noise, trying to fully decriminalize all things, quote, prostitution. Mm -hmm. they're, chipping, they're chipping away at that at state and local levels in terms of laws they're vetoing and repealing. And it's, it's causing, it could be disastrous effects, at least from what I see here in LA and, and the state of California, stuff that happened recently. So part of the good side of all the awareness and all the energy around it, we need to step on the gas pedal because we have an actual, uh, foe an actual enemy if you will there's a spiritual realm of course but there's 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 an actual enemy out there trying to push against the good stuff that we're all about and we're going to have to we're going to have to get stronger yes absolutely bro absolutely patrick true um yeah i think for me that was one reason for starting father con is, is to look at it you know fatherhood as being part of the solution and if you know, like Taylor was mentioning that, that the, the men who are paying for sex are in, in many, many cases married and, and fathers. So the, the, the behavior of fathers is also engaging with this issue. And also, you know, that what they're modeling, their engagement, their love for their, their children, or lack of love thereof, is also making, causing kind of this vulnerability to this, this industry. But I think for me, going after fatherhood, so we're looking at fatherhood as a solution. So then it's, it's kind of like bringing in, bringing in men who are like, who want to engage about something with fatherhood, and then they're learning about human trafficking. So how do we, how do we bring human trafficking into more conversations and into more areas uh, of effort being made? So I'm, I'm now starting to network with as many different father organizations, father-centered organizations, and then bring in the component about human trafficking. That if you get fatherhood right, we can see it. We can see a decline in the vulnerability of our kids to being trafficked, and and we'll see a diminish in, in diminishment of the demand. You know, so it's 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 that's that's kind of my approach. So, so looking at fatherhood as part of that solution, but it's a bigger umbrella. We 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 could empty a lot of prisons if we got fatherhood right. If if we can if we can start to make, you know, like like the like um, um, D Delman said about you know, the, the lack of fathers, fathers growing up without a father in their life. So they're not having someone that can help to model for them. But if we start to expand the number of organizations that are helping those dads who didn't grow up with a dad, um, like here in LA, we have the dad project. So I'm, I'm trying to bring in people from different organizations and then show how this connects to human trafficking. Yeah. Uh, you get, you get this right. And we're going to see a decline in human trafficking. That's right. But, but to really, you know, piggyback onto what Alan said too. I mean, it's just what's happening on the legal front is is a clear threat um and it'll it'll impact it'll impact law enforcement it impacts everything so we really have to to find as many ways as possible to kind of elevate the issue and an understanding of you know legalization and decriminalization is not the answer it, it results in a tremendous increase in demand that's going to have to be met by more more vulnerable people being exploited yeah, I'm glad you said that part too, Patrick. Uh, you know, on uh, our coalition here, well, all of our coalitions, because uh, we expanded recently into Louisiana, and uh, but for all the coalitions, that is a major pillar of it. We have four pillars, and our policy advocacy and research is a very, very necessary one. Um, and every model, wherever we go, God allows us to go and expand. That's a pillar that I keep. And um, just like, you know, we have Texas Attorney General's office on that particular, um, you know, committee i make sure the same thing we're getting now louisiana attorney generals and someone from the governor's office also on that committee because it's a very imperative to have their ear and that they're involved in the conversations and learning from us on you know about these things versus all these you know very passionate groups that may have a lot of zeal without knowledge right and so now when we're pushing bills it gets right into the right hand so like I, that's why we were very effective i know in september um, having the law passed here in Texas with making it a felony if you're caught buying sex, even on your first time, right, is because we could not get a lot of these things pushed if we didn't have those folks here right there and helping us understanding it and designing it. So that is true. Making sure that we have a seat at the table when it comes down to uh, policies and, and that legislation. So thank you both for sharing that and talk, bringing that up. Um, Reverend Howard? Well, I was just thinking... I, uh, my thought was, or a question, prioritizing. Mm -hmm. We prioritize about the COVID, mm -hmm. drugs, gangs, violence, racism. So 
cancer, uh, health issues, all kinds of things. But when it, uh, but things like human trafficking, that is a hundred billion trillion dollar industry. I, I don't. We don't. How do we prioritize that? This, especially in in the uh, black and brown community, is a devastating thing that has been happening to us in this country. Um, perhaps more than any other segment. So, so how do we how do we do how do we prioritize even and I'm just thinking in even in my local congregation we're we're doing mission work over in Africa we're doing uh, relief for the for the victims of the floods and tornadoes and things but 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 how do we somebody help me how do we address this? So this is more front and center. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying, that word awareness, uh, Dr. Greg said awareness uh, is very, very key. Um, and I think groups like this, what we're talking about, because it's getting out there and it's growing, you know, and I have a lot of um, you know, relationships at the government level. Um, there's a lot of new funding coming out and has come out for pilot programs that is involved, uh, you know, dealing with trafficking. Um, so the word is getting out there more and more is just that, you know, I think, like, for instance, someone like you, Dr. Uh, Reverend Howard, is getting your community, having people, like, use your network. You have an amazing resource like Alan, Patrick, you know, Joe right there, Susan. Use those resources to allow to come into your community. I go to L.A. often. I would love to go in there as well and be able to really reach hearts and help them understand. Because once you start getting your community to see that this is a huge issue, because what happens if they're siloed? That's why you're having conversation and dialogue with folks that are saying things like, well, why should I be involved? My kids, I did a great job, right? They don't understand the bigger picture. So you can get help with um, helping them understand that. Then, yeah, because I think that's one of the factors I wanted to say, um, and Alan spoke about it as well, but you're even seeing it on TV now. They're making sitcoms and shows that deal with human trafficking. They, we've never seen that kind of stuff before. That's talking about these cases and things of that nature. So I do see a major movement happening and awakening, but it's because of grassroots people like us, I'm telling you, that has constantly, you know, talked about this broad awareness, speaking at panels, having podcasts like Dr. Greg and so many other folks. So we just have to continue to do that. But I'm telling you, um, the government is paying attention. Um, they are definitely getting a lot more funding available for these things. They're understanding it more through us. Um, you know, I'm a graduate of the first Human Trafficking Leadership Academy the government ever had in 2017. And mm. that's how that was started, to get folks from survivors, male, female, service providers, all of them together for months and months so that we can help them. We can rec do recommendations because they was like, we don't know where to put money and resources. So that's still there, that mindset, I know for a fact, and they've learned so much. Um, so it's happening. I just want to encourage you, but um, it's us to keep on. And I want you to be encouraged. So allow us in um, to be able to help encourage your group, whether it's just your congregation, to help them to see locally what could they what they can do and what people are doing. And uh, you have an older church. You know, you said it. I'll tell you, um, we had Pastor Rafer Owens, the retired sheriff, um, not too long ago on one of our calls, uh, and well, his church did a phenomenal job there in Compton, California. And guess what? It was the elders of the church. That's how it started. It was just the elders. And all they would do was just be good aunties and grandmas. It was mostly the older women. And they would just walk the street and do outreach and just hug up on the girls, pray for them if they wanted it, those kind of things. And that all of a sudden they start, these girls started coming to the church. The girls started contacting the ladies. And that's how a lot of them were able to leave the life made that decision to leave. So it can be something as simple as that, right? Um, so yeah, let use those resources. You're not alone. That's what this call is for, for men to see who's doing what in their area, band together. Um, and maybe it's inviting some of your folks, getting them to come out to some of those awesome events Patrick is doing with the FatherCon, with the, um, you know, see it in the film festival. And, and you know, it's, it's sometimes it's just that little spark um, that I think that would work. Um, so any last final thoughts? CJ, too, I want to tell you, you're an encouragement as well. Yeah, you and Taylor, Taylor being so, you know, young and so passionate and so impactful yeah. in this movement. CJ, you know, actor, 
like I get out, <laughs> I'm just learning about this thing, but I want to learn. And he's taking it very serious, dedicating his time as a man to be on this call on a Saturday morning. Like I look at this, I look at your faces, man, this is phenomenal. And I, I think that we're making major progress. We just cannot um, stop this momentum and continue to grow. I can, I will commit. I'm going to constantly have the Houston men. You're going to see, you constantly be seeing a lot more Houston men on this, on this thing. So accept that challenge, California, West Coast people. Uh, <laughs> so, because the more men we get, and now that I'm in Louisiana, I can promise you, you're going to start seeing Louisiana men on this uh, call. And I did invite a couple, um, the commander and uh, the guy of o Office of Juvenile Justice, and they couldn't be on this one today, but they want to commit to be, to start coming. So let's get as many men and con just continue to get this thing, you know, growing and moving. Any last and final thoughts before we end here? I think Alan was ready. I feel his spirit to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Just real quick, Kenny, I, I get asked all the time, what can I do? What should I do? Yeah. And I always, I don't want to answer too quickly. I got a list of things, but what I want to say is, I don't know, what can you do? Do that. Mm -hmm. Do that. Leverage your background, your education, your platform. I see I, on this call alone, there's some pastors, there's some actors, there's some social workers, there's some activists. Do, do this work for the good of that in your direct community, get a little momentum there and then go to the church next door, go to the, the actors guild. I don't know if that's the right word or not. <laughs> go to, go to the other people that, that you have access to and bring them with you. And if we get enough people doing that, uh, enough people, eventually the circles are going to overlap and we're going to win this battle. That's awesome. Good. I think that that's a phenomenal way to end, my friend. Phenomenal. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking your time this Saturday. Uh, you definitely encourage me more. Um, I look forward to the next call. Uh, please reach out. Everybody has put their information in the chat. Is If there's anyone that um, connected with you or has a resource or doing something you want to learn more about, I encourage you. Everybody on here is phenomenal. Reach out to them. And, uh, you know, and of course, we're wide open here in, you know, Houston, this is our family, you know, we're creating family, whatever we can do to help, let's make it happen. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys, and blessings. Blessings. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.